Hi, everyone. I'm immigration lawyer John Kasravi. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. We have a great guest, Sabrina Damas, uh, a person I really know is crew immigration and handles immigration court hearings. She's the, my go-to person uh, when I have any questions about this. So we're going to talk with her because she also contributed a great article about crew immigration in the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine. Uh, the first issue is out. Just go to immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com slash magazine to catch that. Or the emails or the website's URL is going to link below or this in the in the description box. Um, before we start, I want to thank the sponsors for the magazine: you know, Journey, Emmy Translate, Immigration Finder, and DocuWise. DocuWise always been a very a nice and proud sponsor of the show, who's helped us uh, for for many for some time now. DocuWise is a great uh, immigration software that not only helps your forms and, and, and handling clients that way, but also communication with them securely and all host of other features. If you want to get an extra 10% off discount from your annual plan, please go to uh, www.docuwise.com slash immigration lawyers podcast. And then uh, the code is immigration lawyers podcast. And with that, let's get talked to with Sabrina. How you doing? I'm good, John. How are you? Good. Thanks for, for coming on. And, and thank you so much again for, for doing uh, for submitting it and contributing to the magazine. Uh, it was my a, pleasure. So, you know, you're, uh, I mean, you're, you're in immigration and you do all sorts of stuff, but you have a special experience in immigration and court kind of matters. First of all, because you worked at the court, right? What was your history with the immigration court? So I worked there as a, a judicial law clerk slash attorney advisor for two years from 2011 to 2013. So I was basically doing research and writing decisions for the immigration judges in the LA court. Wonderful. So would that, is that something you recommend for someone's going to court if they can get that job? Because um, yeah, you, know, you get very comfortable with the situation there. You see like the full range of immigration cases in existence when you work at the court, right? You see asylum cases, you see adjustments, you see criminal waivers, cancellation. You even, you know, you even see some of the business stuff that goes wrong at CIS yeah. somewhere, right? You know, 245C, 245K issues you know, that were overlooked by attorneys or not quite calculated, right? Yeah. Um, so you even, before I left, I was even writing some memos on uh, uh, petitions to remove conditions for conditional LPRs from the EB-5 program. Those were even making their way into the immigration court when I was finishing up my term. So yeah, I mean, it's really like a depth and a range that you can't get in private practice when you start in the court system. You would review the cases as they're coming in. So if some lawyers submitted a package of information, you have to read through it? Yeah, I mean, so typically the cases were coming to us towards the end, like when a merits hearing had already been done, or if it was coming down to an issue of statutory eligibility, right, where they might not even get to a merits case because they thought this person's mm -hmm. crime disqualifies them or something like that. Um, but yeah, we would see, you know, if anything had been filed at CIS that had been referred, we'd see that. If it had been filed in the court, we would see that. We'd see briefing, we'd see motions practice, evidentiary packets, applications. Um, oftentimes we were listening to the recordings of the hearings for witness testimony. It's the whole kind of range of, of the evidence that you see. And like, how were the, the lawyers work? Was, you know, there's, there's a lot of messy stuff you probably see in there. Um, how did it affect your case when you get someone's packet is all over the place or the information is kind of messed up? Did it, how did it come up? I I mean, it definitely doesn't leave a good impression. Um, and it also makes it harder for us, the people working in that we're working in the court to sort of sort out like, where are the where are the problems here? How did this get to me to begin with? Right. Um, that being said, the, the attorneys that were doing really good, well organized packets, well written briefs stood out even more in some ways. It was a sigh um, of relief. You're like, okay, I can find the information yeah. I'm going to sift into everything. And it's just like any other court. You see the full range of that kind of stuff. Everything from like, where did you learn to do law to this is awesome. Thank you. Like you just wrote my decision for me. Um, so it's, and, a good, it's a good variety. And soon afterwards, you started private practice. Um, you know, this is an area that constantly changes. Uh, there's federal litigation every day. And you, you've been involved in federal litigation and for the court even uh, for the I think Ninth Circuit, you've argued as well. Yes, so I've done both district court litigation and Ninth Circuit work. How do you how do you stay on top of it? I mean, you have a great Twitter feed actually where you post it and study. Is it part of your practice is constantly reading this stuff? Yeah, so I used to be able to do it like every week. I'd go through all. I started with just the Ninth Circuit, then I would do published and unpublished at the Ninth Circuit. At the peak of it, I was reading every published and unpublished decision from all the circuits. That lasted for like a really small period of time because <laughs> that is super intensive. At this point. About once a month, I go through the last 30 days of all the appellate courts, the BIA, all the published decisions, both 
the ones that are immigration petitions and also criminal sentencing cases because they often use the same categorical, modified categorical analysis that we use in immigration. So they're kind of interchangeable to a certain extent in terms of the way of an analysis of a particular statute. And then I, I keep a, like a, I call it a blog. It's like, a, they call it a journal on Squarespace, but whatever you want to call it, it's a one web page on my website that is just devoted to these case summaries. And then I re, you know, retweet them out and put them on the Facebook page for the office. And that just keeps me like as a lawyer sharp, like I read these things. I know, which courts are doing good asylum, which ones are doing good crimmigration cases, which ones think TPS is an admission for adjustment, which ones think it's not, you know, and that really helps me to see trends, right? To see the trends um, and also just to keep sharp on like new issues. Okay, TPS is going to the Supreme Court. I better try to advance all those TPS adjustments I have yeah. in court and see if I can get them done before SCOTUS can mess everything up for me. Now, uh, you know, a lot of USCIS based attorneys like myself don't really need to use Westlaw or Lexis and those kind of stuff. But uh, for your kind of uh, work, do you have to have access to those kind of databases to use them? I have Westlaw and I couldn't live without it. Um, you know, when I started off on my own solo practice, which is like six and a half years ago, I knew some of our colleagues were relying on Google Scholar because it was free. Um, I didn't think that the algorithm for doing citing references on Google Scholar was very good. Maybe it's better six and a half years later. Um, and I know that there's lots of other options now too. Fast case, right, which I think comes with an ALA link membership through ALA. Um, I've never used it. I, you know, I think I was spoiled in the court. We had both Westlaw and Lexis, which are, you know, sort of top of the line legal research doesn't get any better. And I just got very accustomed to knowing that even if the case had only been published two days earlier, that it was going to be on Westlaw and I was going to find it. And also that I was going to find unpublished cases because when you're doing research, there's like a, you know, 80% chance that no court has decided yet if your statute is a crime involving moral turpitude um, in a published decision, but there might be unpublished decisions or unpublished decisions on similar statutes that can kind of show you where the court is trending on this issue. So yeah, personally, I find Westlaw to be invaluable, must have resource for my work. You know, side note, like when I was in law school, I just, I think we got Westlaw first before they give us Lexus or something. I just got into Westlaw more than Lexus. Um, is, is it the same for you? How did you get towards Westlaw instead of Lexus? You know, I don't remember in law school because I think we had access to both um, for whatever. And when we were in court, we had access to both. But for whatever reason, I just chose to use Westlaw through my two years at the court. And so I'm more accustomed to it. So when I went out in, on my own into private practice, um, actually, Lexus is a little bit cheaper, but I was just so used to Westlaw. And I decided that whatever, you know, the $10 a month difference or whatever it was, it wasn't anything super big was worth it because I was already accustomed to all the search functions and I knew where to go to do this and that on Westlaw. So I kept it. Does Westlaw have those features where you search title and stuff like that? Or you might not have the full package to do that anyways, but. Yeah, I don't, you mean like the people search kind of things like background checks, not the legal stuff. I don't know. I know that is a, a good thing on Lexus. And now there are maybe times where we're worried about our clients and you know, where they got some of um, their identification information from um, that we would like to run people searches, you know, on some of them. I've never done that. I know some lawyers do um, do that with, with uh, Lexus. I don't know if Westlaw has that kind of mechanism or not. I've never looked into it. It's a good question. <laughs> Sorry, I got aside out of tangent. So no, it's a good question. You know, I have, uh, because I taught Loyola and at Pepperdine, they gave me full access to everything they have, but I don't really use it unless I'm just doing some scholarly research. Except one case we needed to do uh, to prove the person was a citizen. So we needed the father who's passed away, his documentation that he lived in the U.S. for five years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, oh, let's, let's give it a shot. So I went to Lexus and I, yeah. I found you know, uh, property ownership in, in Atlanta, Georgia, all this kind of stuff. And they hired a private investigator and I found more stuff. Uh, on Lexus and the private investigator did, you know, they just took the money and didn't do anything. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. They could do that kind of stuff. And they got the passport. So it was wonderful. Um, so uh, Good job, counsel. Thank you. <laughs> so what does 2021 look like for you? There's a lot of changes happening. I'm sure you're getting the phone calls. Uh, Biden's new law is here. What do we do? Uh, yes. Emails. Oh, so many questions about Biden's new law from clients. Um, and it doesn't help that there are some of our colleagues out there that are putting out, you know, big flyers about come consult with me about the Biden bill. Um, and the clients are missing the fine print at the bottom that says not actually a law yet. 
<laughs> um, so yes, I've definitely had to field a couple calls from people and calm them down that there's nothing new actually out there. They're not missing out on anything. If there is an actual reform bill, I'll be the first one to start making calls to my clients who could benefit. Um, but what does 21, 2021 have for us? Well, I, I brought on a new staff member. So we have a new paralegal who joined our team. So now we're three, uh, I have, we're three full-time staff, including me and one part-time person. Um, so that was that's new and exciting to have a new team member joining us and joining us in the middle of a pandemic where we're remote working most of the time. So I was training her on Zoom, you know, OK, this is this is our client database. This is our time tracking software. We use Google Drive. This is how it works. I realized I have to sign her up for share files still or, you know, our secure document platform. So that's all fun because we we've only been in this is her third week with us, I think. And we've only been in the office together once since she started. So, you know, uh, lots of technology investment, bought a scanner and a, and a laptop and shipped them to her. Um, what scanner did you get? That's a, that's always a fun one. Scanner's so important. Everybody, so I was like late to the snap scan bandwagon. Yeah. And so everybody says the 500 was better than the 1500. So I've got 1500 snap scans. I've got one here for me, one at the office and now one in the new paralegals um, home as well. Um, you know, so I, that's, that's, our, we also have a big Xerox, you know, multifunction Xerox in the office, but it was getting to be that there were too many of us to have one multifunction be the printer yeah. scanner and, um, and the copy machine, right. For paginating court filing. So I was like, time to invest in a couple of other scanners and printers around the office. Yeah. <laughs> Cause we'd have times where I was printing out contracts before the pandemic for, you know, for consults. And I'd go out and I'd find that my assistant, my legal assistant was in the middle of a 500 page asylum filing being patriated. I'd be like, why don't you go grab a Starbucks down the block and come back in 20 minutes and I'll have your contract printed for you. You know, it took me like a couple of years into my own solo practice before I got a, a full uh, dedicated scanner. I used the printer scanner, which is horrible. And when I got, it, I was like, oh my God, that was such a failure in life to not get a, a right? scanner. It's a game changer. So when I, um, my first year, I shared an office space with a, a colleague, a mentor, who actually now shares office space in our suite again with me. But it was his, he had a desk, like a secretarial bay that he let me have for my first year as a solo, right? Um, and I just had, I just printed, you know, the, I had a little, a little scanner that could do like five documents at a time and printed to the office printer. When I moved into my first office space of my own, I thought, okay, time to get one of those, you know, 30 at a time, you know, can do 30 or 50 page, you know, desktop scanners. And it was awful. I don't know what, like, I think I just like got a, like a dud in the manufacturing because it was scanning things and they would show up blue in the file on my screen. So I just went off and bought a refurbished Xerox machine, like a used, used Xerox and was like, I'm done. Right. Cause I was, I, I remember the turning point was I had a, an, an asylum withholding cat case I was working on in, for a detained client. And it was a thousand pages of documents and I was hand numbering the pages. And then I was trying to scan the filing so that I could save it to the drive. I was there like all day just doing that. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's the sign. It's time to get a bigger, better copy, you know, scan something that paginates for me. I skipped the bait stamp thing altogether. I went from writing in pen to having a copy machine that can do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, so, you know, if, if reform does happen, you're probably going to get another double up or triple up to, to be able to handle the case in, in Los Angeles. Yeah, I don't know. I know some of our colleagues are all are all excited and are like, I'm hiring new staff and getting a bigger office. I'm, I'm kind of just taking it one step at a time, right? December brought DACA back for new applicants. So we've, we've seen, you know, 10, 12 new clients coming through in the last couple months who are DACA eligible. Right. Um, got clients who had DACA but lost it because of a DUI, but have gotten it expunged. And I feel a little bit better now about the likelihood that those might get through USCIS telling yeah. them, hey, let's try it. Advance paroles back. Maybe we can do adjustment for you and not a cancellation case in court. Um, but I'm not I'm not gearing up to like triple the staff and the technology uh, you know, capabilities quite yet for a reform bill. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm kind of like the consummate pessimist about immigration reform. And I think there's a 0% chance the Biden bill will get passed. And there's maybe like a 5 to 10% chance that we get 
a really watered down version, like a dream act out of it, which would be wonderful for 800,000 plus people. I just don't think it's going to be, you know, the, the, the massive, you know, multi-million person coverage that we, that some of our colleagues are really enthusiastic about. It's, I was, you know, I'm, I'm the same boat as you. Like I'm, I come on the pessimist side on this kind of stuff. I may be like, it's wild if it does pass through, but it's, it's way too ambitious. I hope I'm wrong. I hope it passes and like all that stuff comes. Um, Mm -hmm. Although there's a portion of it that will amend the definition of conviction and my post-conviction really practice will become completely unnecessary. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Another question I wanted to ask you is, uh, I forgot the question I was going to ask, but oh yeah, uh, what's going on the court? Uh, Is in LA, are they open yet or are you going or not open yet? (laughs) They are open, limited fashion. I've done, my office has done, I want to say like maybe five merits since September when they opened. Um, They're open though, like things are just getting kicked around. I had a merits hearing that was supposed to be next month that got kicked to 2023. And then I did a motion to advance and the judge granted it seven months earlier into 2022 because I'm assuming that was the best she could offer me. Um, You know, we had another merits that was supposed to be like next week now it's in next february and you know it's it's becoming a problem for cancellation cases right well tps adjustments we all swallowed our hearts through our throats when the supreme court took up the their case on whether tps is an admission and i've started trying to advance all those hearings especially for the clients who don't otherwise have relief um available besides that and you know the but I have some cancellation cases, you know, where the qualifying relatives are are teenage kids with serious health issues. But if you keep kicking it two years down the line and then we have to wait two or three years for a visa number to become available, that child's going to age out. Um, so that's being really frustrating. We've been doing a lot of motions to advance citing age out issues. Um, so far, they've been granted one that one that was supposed to happen and then got kicked to December. We made a motion to advance like two weeks ago and the judge put it uh, back on calendar for the first week of March for us. So it's like, OK, back to prep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're open, but it's just this crazy amount of inconsistent scheduling. Now we're getting these emails from EOIR, like which judges are actually going to be on the bench on any given week you know, about for about a month in, in advance. So that's at least a little bit helpful. We can look and say, OK, my merits hearing in the third week of March is actually not going to happen because the judge that is supposed to have the case is not going to be on the bench. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then it's like you're, you're, if you find out only three weeks in advance, you've probably already done your 30 day trial filing. Oh, and now you're going to have to do it again in another year or whenever the rescheduled hearing is. So it's, it's frustrating. And is there any word on prosecutorial discretion? Is it, are you able to talk with, uh, with, uh, ICE yet, attorneys yet, or is it uh, still on hold? Um, so, you know, there have been two memos that are like the new Biden prosecute. What I'm thinking of is the prosecutorial discretion memos of the Biden administration. Um, I think the sort of rank and file of DHS, both the, you know, the legal advisor, you know, in OPLA and the ERO, you know, deportation officers are still trying to, it's not filtered down yet what they're supposed to do with it. So, I have made a few, you know, requests under the memos, um, you know, thus far. I haven't done a, you know, like a joint motion to reopen request yet. I've got a couple of those in the pipeline. We'll see what they do with them. Mostly I'm getting either oil attorneys at the Ninth Circuit who are like, sure, let's just put this in mediation and see what happens, right? Or I'm getting ICE officers that don't know what to do yet if they should let my client out because they're not an enforcement priority, you know, so... I haven't gotten any firm no's. That's, I guess, the good thing. I just have gotten a lot of hang on. We're waiting for guidance. So, yeah. makes sense. Well, thank you so much for coming on again. You've been a regular on the show. If if people want to, you know, catch up with you, you have I, your Twitter account's really good because you do post um, your decision ratings. I always catch that. I always there's always one case. I'm like, oh, I didn't know about that. It's always good to see. So, if there's any social media uh, things that handles that you have, you could you could plug. That'd be great. So I've got a YouTube channel that I just started last week um, where, you know, we got two videos up now. The goal is to put a video a week, a little two to three minutes, something about a topic, right? So last week we did advanced parole, why it might be helpful to DACA and TPS holders. This week we did um, unreasonable delay lawsuits in federal court. I'm having, I'm personally having a ton of fun with those cases, those types of cases in federal court in the last year. So feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can follow me on Twitter at Damask ESQ. 
Um, and the Loft of Sabrina DeMass also has a Facebook page. Um, so both Twitter and Facebook are places you can find the, the case summaries. And uh, the other place is if you go to my website, www.sabrinademass.com, scroll down to the bottom, you'll see this very, um, this very curious thing about signing up for my newsletter. I don't really have a newsletter. It's just the blog posts that go out. Anytime I blogged in the last 24 hours at 10 a.m. on that day, it'll shoot you an email with those summaries. So they'll come direct to your inbox. And occasionally we put other stuff up there too. Um, interesting things that we've done as an office, right? Other announcements, right? TPS extensions and things like that that come out of USCIS that are important. So, you know, just another great resource, hopefully, for keeping on top of all these changes. Awesome. For Sabrina, thank you so much for, for, for everything you're doing, all the help you've given me and the, and the bar. I appreciate it once again. Oh, John, thank you so much. And thank you for creating this great resource for our colleagues, right? Writing for the, mag the initial inaugural issue of the magazine was fantastic. I'll be happy to do it again if you uh, want some more immigration stuff. And I look yeah. forward to when we're vaccinated and we get to hang out in person again together. Yeah, that's great. You grab some, some vegetarian food or vegan or vegetarian? No. Vegetarian. I'll do dairy. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> All right, Sabrina. Talk soon. Bye, John. Have a great day. Thank you.